Hello and welcome everyone to the Get Started with OCI AI Language Service Developer Lab. My name is Tara Van Cleve and I'm a marketing event manager for the developer initiative here at Oracle. Today, we're excited to show you how OCI Language Service empowers developers with production ready pre-trained models to automate sophisticated text analysis at scale without requiring any machine learning expertise. You'll also have the opportunity to participate in a short quiz on the material covered in today's lab. Upon completing the quiz, you'll receive a developer masterclass badge that you can share on your social media recognizing your commitment and earned expertise. If you have any questions during the lab, please ask them in the Slack channel and we'll answer them throughout the session. Today's lab will be presented by Luis Cabrera Cordon, Senior Director of Product Management for AI Services. And Premier Sarkar, Senior Manager for AI Services, will be answering the Q&A questions. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Luis. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. And thank you, Premier, for helping uh, uh, field questions. So while I am the one speaking most of the time, uh, Premier will be of great help because um, if you get stuck or something, please just let us know. And then, uh, you know, Premier uh, can, can, can help you individually or uh, he can answer your questions. So thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. All right, so I'm gonna get started by sharing my screen. And um, so we have here, let's start right here. Um, okay, perfect. So we're gonna talk about OCI language today. And more specifically, we're gonna follow the workshop or the lab that if you go to the, to the main page for, uh, for uh, OCI language, right? It, it will give you a link to try the workshop. So that will take you to this to this workshop, um, you must have received a set of uh, prerequisites before the lab for you to install on your machine. Uh, for instance, uh, we're gonna do a part where you need Python. So, so we expect you to have Python on your machine. Um, if you didn't, for some reason, don't worry about it. Uh, my recommendation would be to simply kind of follow what we're doing and we're gonna send the recording to you after, after uh, we do the session. And you can always do it on your own time because there is not enough time for you to try to catch up, uh, you know, like setting up policies or, or installing Python uh, if you didn't get a chance to do the prerequisites. So with that said, uh, if just before I start uh, the, the actually going like step by step on the lab, I just want to... Um, so, okay, so OCI language is one of many AI services that we have as part uh, of the Oracle Cloud. And uh, so we have digital assistant services. Uh, if you wanna create bots, we have, um, we're actually releasing very quickly the, the speech and vision capabilities. So this has to do with, you know, speech to text uh, uh, capabilities. For instance, if you wanted to understand what people are saying on a, on a call or something like that, uh, vision capabilities and, and also document understanding capabilities that are part of vision today. And uh, then we, uh, well, we have a release uh, anomaly detection, a detection for general availability. We did that last year. And then we recently did forecasting, um, which uh, it's now in LA. So speech, vision and forecasting are currently in limited availability, but if you contact us, we can uh, connect you so that you can start using them right away. So, okay, with that said, let's, uh, let's go for the, for the actual uh, lab and uh, let me, let's go right here. So first of all, uh, you all should have access to your Oracle Cloud account. I believe you all uh, got white listed so you don't even have to enter a credit card. It should look something like this. And if you go to analytics and AI and then click on language, you should see this getting started uh, page uh, that explains what language uh, models we have available for you. Um, so and it also has uh, a lot of really good resources. Actually, the first of the resources is the workshop that we're doing itself. Uh, links to documentation, the API reference, uh, 
links to or SDK, for instance, and many, many questions. So uh, that, that, uh, that are frequently asked that they are answered already. So uh, I recommend you take a look at the, the, the resources available to you, but hopefully by the end of this session, you will be an expert. So, so you will know how to use each of these resources. So first let's understand what AI, what AI services do and in this specific case, what OCI language provides to you. So AI services, you can think of them as uh, uh, capabilities that allow you to harness the power of machine learning or artificial intelligence without being uh, an expert data scientist. And in many cases, without even having data, um, like in the case of the pre-trained models we're gonna look at today. So um, this allows you to use uh, AI capabilities, um, you know, and uh, if you're just a developer like, like most of us. So specifically in the area of language, uh, we have pre-trained models that do things such as language detection, uh, pre-trained uh, text classification, extraction of key phrases, uh, identify named entities such as organizations, locations, names of people, and uh, sentiment analysis. Let me see. So someone is saying, please zoom in a bit. Uh, fair enough. Let me. I have a. I have a zooming app so that we can um, also like zoom into a specific area. Uh, actually, that's not what I want to do. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to zoom it zoom a little bit here uh, so you can see a little more. And then uh, I'm going to focus on areas like this. I hope that helps, Eric. So, yeah, so, so these are some of the areas that we're talking about, right? So we, we can also do sentiment analysis. Um, this has to do with how people feel about something that they're writing about. And we can do that at the aspect uh, document and sentiment, uh, sorry, and sentence level. So, uh, why don't we give it a try? And by the way, well, what we're doing right now is essentially the equivalent of the analyzing the text in the console, which is lab one. Okay. Automatically the system uh, provides some sample text for you. And we're just gonna do that to start with. And uh, you can analyze it. And then each of the capabilities that we just discussed the, the models are gonna uh, be used. These are pre-trained models, deep learning models uh, that uh, can understand text, have understood uh, or have learned the intricacies of language. Okay, so let's take a look. So this, this text has something to do with uh, the Zoom interface being very simple uh, to conduct virtual meetings. And, uh, you know, it talks about Zoom having a lot of participants, uh, uh, and that it shows Oracle Corporation for its cloud infrastructure development, right? So a little bit of advertising for OCI right there. Uh, and um, we can see that we detected that the language for the text was English. And this number right here, whenever you see a number like that, that refers to our confidence score, uh, how certain we are that that is English indeed. Um, for text classification, we have uh, about 600 domains and subdomains. And in this case, this text was classified as a computer and electronics uh, and domain. And then within that domain, the software subdomain, which, uh, which makes sense, right? We're talking about this some application. And then named entity recognition has to do with identifying um, names of organizations, emails, locations, people, quantities. So there, there is a list of entities that we identify and the system essentially has learned what, what different entities sound like. It's not like it has a dictionary, right? It, uh, it doesn't have a dictionary where it says Oracle Corporation is, a, is an organization. Instead, just like you and I have understood that, hey, if something says corporation at the end, most likely it's an organization or, uh, or uh, I don't know, Google, that sounds like an organization, just the, the, the way that it's, you know, uh, that it sounds and the way that it's used in the context, that must be the name of an organization, right? So um, 
very exciting capability. This could be very useful, for instance, if you have, uh, let's say, uh, some text in a document and you want to quickly identify, hey, who are the people that are mentioned, let's say, in this contract, right? Or what are the companies mentioned here? So that then later on, you can more quickly find the information that you need. Okay, let's continue to explain these capabilities. Key phrase extraction is a little bit different. So key phrase extraction has to do with finding what are the, the most important phrases mentioned. And the in this case, the bigger the text, the, the better uh, this is because it will find like similar terminology that is used elsewhere in the text to kind of group, hey, what are the key topics essentially? Think, uh, think of this as the automatic hashtagger, right? And the, the elements are provided in order of importance. The text that we just did is very small. So, so everything is about the same level of importance, but very quickly we can find out that uh, this related to a Zoom interface, virtual meetings, and you know, Zoom link and, and video conferences, right? And uh, let's explain the last capability, which is sentiment analysis. So once again, this has to do with how I feel about what I wrote. Yeah, do I do I express uh, frustration or uh, am I uh, super excited about what's there, right? So, so essentially we rank things as positive, neutral, uh, negative, or, or maybe they have mixed sentiment. And uh, we can do that at the document level. For instance, in this case, it was mixed sentiment. It's like essentially there is a little bit of uh, negative or, or positive capabilities that are mentioned there and, and essentially it's, it's mixed. But uh, for instance, here we can say that, hey, they are talking positively about the Zoom interface. This is called aspect level sentiment because it associates what people are saying, in this case, simple and easy to conduct virtual meetings, which is a positive thing, and associates that with the aspect, which is the Zoom interface. We also have sentence level sentiment. And as you can imagine, that's just uh, essentially uh, for each sentence, we tell you whether it's positive or negative overall. But my favorite, at least personally, is the aspect level sentiment because it has more information um, that you can act on because you know exactly what uh, aspects uh, you know, get the positive and the negative feedback. Okay, uh, all right, perfect. Um, let me check if there are any questions so far. So I would like you to try something. Why don't you enter something here in the text and analyze it yourself? I'm gonna enter uh, something like I am having, uh, let's see, just for fun. My name is Luis Cabrera and I am having a great time, great time with uh, the workshop. Uh, the attendees are asking many questions, uh, so they are engaged. I don't know. So in this case, I'll analyze it. <laughs> well, we made a mistake here. It's uh, probably there is not enough information here for the text classification, but you can tell that it detected that the language was English. It identified my name. Uh, there is an event going on, this workshop, right? The key phrases. And obviously everything I said was very positive. If I had uh, maybe, um, uh, changed it this to I am having a terrible time the real time with the workshop and the attendees are not engaging or something like that, but you are. This is just so that we can get it, unfortunately. I wish um, they had done the prerequisites. I don't know, something like that. Then you can see then this turn into negative, right? Uh, sentiment because I am having a terrible time and the workshop is not going well, whatever, right? Um, so, oh, sorry. I said the yeah, attendees are not engaging. I was wondering why I was getting a uh, neutral sentiment there, hopefully. Yeah, and you can see then it got negative sentiment because they weren't engaging or something like that. Okay, the other thing is, um, I have to say that right now this works in English. We're, we're working on adding uh, more 
more and more languages, uh, starting with Spanish and Portuguese. Um, but for now, this works in English. The only part that does work in over 100 languages today is the language detection, obviously. Uh, so if I were to type something in Spanish, which is a language that I know, I could say, uh, yo estoy contento de estar aquí. Aquí con ustedes. Buenos días. I don't know. Good morning. I'm happy to be with you today. And then you can see that, uh, that it is able to identify the uh the the language for instance right so so that works over 100 languages already okay so i think with that we are done with um with task one uh oh yeah no sorry let me show you one thing so when you call this from a from a programmatic interface right you are not going to have this pretty UI. What you're going to get is, uh, you know, JSON or a response for each of these. And you may want to understand the format of that JSON so that, uh, um, you know, so that you can actually parse it, for instance. So the, the UI has this link. Let me zoom in here. This, oops, sorry about that. I messed up here. Oh, what am I doing? Cancel. I don't know what I did there. Okay, so sorry, the UI has this uh show json element right there and um if you click on it then you will be able to see the output for each of the oops sorry the output for each of the uh requests so in this case when i the system issued a, a request to detect the language uh, in this case this was the response uh, you know like Essentially, there is a, a single language that was identified in this case, and it's Spanish, and with a 98% confidence, and uh, and so forth, right? So you can kind of see the schema for each of the different uh, um, the different endpoints or the different APIs that we have. But we're going to learn to do this programmatically, so I'm not going to worry too much about that for now. I just wanted to make you aware that that's an easy way to to see the response um as you will see it if you were to make a rest api call okay okay so let's move on to lab number two so we are done with lab one and we're gonna learn how to call the language within the oracle cloud uh, command line interface so um that requires a, a policy uh which was in the in the prerequisites we send you. But once you have that, then essentially you can write scripts to make calls um, to the service. And uh, this explains how to do it, but uh, I'm gonna walk you through it in a second. I'm just gonna copy one of the commands that is right here at the bottom, uh, just so that I don't have to spend the time typing. So how do you do that? You come and click on this little button right there that brings up the uh, cloud shell. And once you are in the cloud shell, uh, I'm gonna paste the text from the, from the lab. And I know that's super small for you to see, but I'm gonna try to zoom into it a little bit. Okay, so you can see Essentially, it's a command that says OCI AI language, and then it's what service we're using. The, the actual uh, 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 model we're going to invoke, in this case, language detection, then minus minus text, and then the, the actual text in quotes. So in this case, the European, the European sovereign death crisis, blah, blah, blah. It's some, some, something about the period of time. Uh, um for an economic event so i'm gonna click enter and this will actually give you the response in this case i'm trying to just detect the language of this text right and it's equivalent to what i was seeing in the in the ui right so you can see the json right here that says this is english with a 99.99 percent .99 certainty right um okay so if you want, you can um, you can try on your own 
um, any of the capabilities here, or maybe you can you can do your own. For instance, uh, I don't know. Let, let's do named entity. I like like named entity recognition, for instance, right? But I'm gonna enter my own text this time. So I'm gonna paste that, and I hope you're doing the same as I'm speaking. And I'm gonna enter some uh, some entities here that I that I know you should you should catch. So uh, bear with me for a second. I know it's hard to see. I'm gonna zoom into it in just a second. So I'll say, hey, um, John and Paul entered into an agreement. An agreement. Um, Paul with will sell. Um, is Ford F-150 to John for, I don't know, $235. Uh, he will, um, uh, and just for fun, I would say, uh, John will send a receipt to, uh, I don't know, Paul at foo.com, okay? I put quotes at the end. And then I'm gonna hit enter. So let's um, let me increase the size of this so we can see what I did. So once again, OCI AI language. In this case, I did detect entities instead of detect language, and then the text. And then I entered the poll that I uh, sorry the text that I just mentioned where John and Paul are entering into an agreement. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to use some kind of text that had a lot of entities. And you can see, for instance, in this case, the, it responded with the entities. In this case, John is the name of a person. It found that at offset zero. And by offset, we mean like num the character count, right? So that's char char character number zero. And it had a length of four characters, J-O-H-N, right? And uh, so it gives us the length and the offset of each of the terms that it finds, just in case you want to do highlighting, for instance, in the text. And uh, it can tell us whether um, that's private identifiable information. That's what this is PII means. So in this case, that's the name of a person. So it could be considered private identifiable information. And that's important because in some cases, we may have text in our systems that we want to kind of scan for private identifiable information, such as names of people or emails, things like that. And uh, this could help us, uh, you know, um, so that we can automate part of the process at least, right? At least we can issue flags and have someone review the content. Okay, so let me see. And it found, uh, just for fun, it found, uh, you know, cardinals like uh, um, in, in this case, um, let me see, where was this? So the text was 35. Uh, I don't remember when I typed 35, but someone in there must have typed 35. And then, uh, like the email, right? Like was caught as well. And uh, once again, that's PII uh, as well, for instance, right? So, okay, perfect. Uh, so I hope that this gives you an idea of you can how you can use the the console, and um, you I guess the cloud shell and. Uh, now we're gonna learn how to use OCI language uh, programmatically using the, actually, I think, uh, are we gonna first? No, we're gonna, yeah, programmatically using the SDKs. Any questions so far? I, I feel like I have been going uh, pretty quickly. Anyone getting stuck or anything like that? Let's see. Uh, Pramir, do you see any questions that have not been answered? I guess maybe we're good. Yeah, we are good there. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so then we're gonna um, learn to call our language as the case uh, from, uh, from code, right? And uh, for that, we need a software development kit. And uh, we have software development kits for Java, Python, TypeScript, JavaScript, .NET, Go, and Ruby. So pretty much any language that you want to write on, we have an SDK for. And um, one thing that I wanted to, to show you, let me see. Um, 
And this is not in the lab because we're working on this, but it could be a very useful um, resource. So we have this GitHub rep repository with uh, data science and AI samples. And in that we have an AI services section. So we have, you know, essentially some, some sample programs or uh, small programs so that you can see this in action in, in complete projects. So for instance, in .NET, uh, we, this explains how to get started with the .NET SDK, what you should install and so forth. And then there is an actual solution. Um, for instance, this one uses a, a, creates a wrapper on top of the, the code. And then you can see that it's um, actually, actually issuing requests. Like in this case, uh, uh, you can see this one is extracting key phrases. It explains how to generate a document how to issue the request and so forth. And uh, so that could be a, a very useful resource. So once again, um, let me zoom into the URL. So github.com, Oracle, OCI data science AI samples. So that's the repository. It could be, it could be useful to you. So, but in the lab itself, there is uh, some, um, there are some examples and a step-by-step -step guide in the, in the case of the lab, it focuses on Python. Um, but before we can actually write the, the Python code, uh, there is a very important step that we need to do. We need to uh, essentially uh, provide credentials that will allow our system to, to know who, I mean, who is calling this service, right? Like uh, who, who has the credentials to use this OCI account? So, and this is important, not just for language, but for any uh, API calls that you will make from your system. And there are different ways to authenticate, but this is just one of them. So I'm gonna uh, share with you how to do that. I created a little diagram here in my slides, just so that um, it's a little bit easier to understand. So let me, uh, essentially we need to create a, an OCI folder. And within that OCI folder, there will be two files. Uh, so that is the config file that has a, a set of fields that we need to fill, like who the user is and what the tenancy is and so forth. And one of the fields there will point to a different uh, file, a PEM file. And this PEM file will have a private key that will be used to uh, confirm that this is indeed you who is using the service and um, that will essentially authenticate on your behalf. So, so when we're writing this code right now, it's, it's saying, oh, okay, so I, I have, a, let's say, Luis's rights and therefore I can use the service. So um, the way to do that, you're gonna go to, uh, as the lab shows, we're gonna go to user settings. So you're gonna click on your profile, user settings. And then there is this concept here on the left called API keys. So click on that. And then you are going to add an API key. So click on that. And this will give you the option to download the, the private key. So that's that, 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 when you click that, that will generate that PEM file or the private key file. And uh, before that, actually, so that we have a place to put it, um, you're gonna create an OCI folder. So um, let me just show you. So I had, I had already created an OCI folder here. Um, in your case, you, you have to create it. So make a, make a directory. Just to be clear, it's a little bit different in, in Mac and Windows. So for Windows, you wanna make it in your home drive and your home path. Uh, that, so in this case, you can see for me, if I were to set, um, so actually let me say set home. So you can see my, my, so home drive for me is C colon and home path is users like over there. So that means that I'm gonna create this OCI folder 
in inside C colon users slash Le Cabrer. In your system, of course, it will have a different name, but um, you can follow the lab. And if you're using Windows, you could essentially just kind of copy and paste that in your console, make directory, and it will create that folder. If you are using OS, uh, Mac OS or Linux, then it's a little bit simpler. You just uh, make directory in your root, um, in your user one, uh, in your user folder, and then dot oci simple as simple as that once you have that folder we're going to go back to here and when you click add api keys and you download it you're going to save that um you're going to or move it or whatever like you're going to uh you're going to save it um to the your oci folder right so in this case for me is dot uh, oci and I will save it right here, right? In my case, I renamed, I, ex, I did exactly that earlier and I renamed that to private.pem just because it's a little bit easier for me to do that. But essentially you want to have that PEM file in the .oci folder. Okay. Then you click add. And then this will give you this text that is critical. So don't, don't get rid of it. You make sure to copy it. And that's what you're gonna use for your config file. So you're gonna create a config file. Let me open it in Notepad here. But you're gonna paste that. I already had done it, so I'm not gonna paste it again. But the only difference between, actually I'll just paste it right here so you can see the difference uh, between what I have now and what I just pasted is this uh, private um, key private key file path that it says to do, right? So you wanna replace that with the path to your PM document, like your private key. So I'm gonna delete that because I had already done it. But um, you wanna you wanna make sure that you have the full path to the private.pem right there so that the system can find, uh, when, they re when it reads the config file, it knows where to find the private key. You just have to do this once and you just have to do it. Actually, you have to do it once for, for all of the SDKs, not just for language, right? Like maybe you're using server, like maybe you're using language and vision and I don't know, data integration or whatever. You just have to do this once and then uh, the system knows whenever you're using uh, OCI from, uh, from this computer, it knows where to find the credentials. Okay, so I'm gonna close. I'm assuming that you guys were able to uh, create a config file and uh, it's just a text file by the way, um, but without the TXT extension. And uh, that you have uh, it pointing to your PM file. Okay, so I'm just gonna erase it because I already had the information there. So you should have only two folders, private.pm and config. Don't worry about this OCAS text of TXT. I just use that to remember what account I'm pointing to. Okay, Any, anyone stuck or having questions? This is your chance for Premier to help you. Okay, let's move on. Once you have done that, then uh, we are now at, um, uh, steps two, where uh, you should have set up Python. So just to be clear, I can I can do Python minus minus version. I can check that I have Python installed. You should be able to do the same. Let me see if I can increase the font size here a little. Okay, and then uh, once again, I can also make sure that I have pip installed. And uh, then I'm gonna create a virtual environment. By the way, some of you may be on uh, virtual networks and I know that for me, um, from virtual network, creating Python environments just doesn't work very well. So I disconnect from the, from the virtual network. Okay, and then uh, I'm gonna follow this step where we're creating a virtual environment for Python or where the OCI SDK. So I'm gonna, um, 
do Python 3. Actually, let me change folder so that I don't do it on my .oci account, uh, on my OCI folder. I'm going to create just on my uh, username uh, folder. I am going to uh, create a virtual environment and I'm going to call it February 16 M. And uh, now this will set up an environment for me. This takes a couple of minutes. Uh, that uh, there you go, it's done. Uh, that now I need to activate. So this created a folder uh, called Fev16M, and you can see there there is um, there are a, there is a set of scripts. Um, for that, and one of them I can use to activate. By the way, in in Mac OS, to activate the environment is a little bit different. You you type source and the name of the virtual environment that you created slash bin slash activate, right? So so essentially you're sourcing that file called activate. For Windows, uh, because it's a batch file, you literally just run the activate command. So I can. Uh, I'll do it right here just so you can see it. So actually I could go like, I guess I am in the Fev 16 m folder. So I'm just gonna do slash scripts, slash activate. And you can see that it got activated because my path changed, right? Like now it shows the name of the environment at the very beginning. Now I will install the OCI SDK. Very simple, pip install OCI. And uh, I don't know, this takes like a couple of seconds. So you can see it's it's installing right there. And while that's installing, uh, let me tell you what we're gonna do next. So we have this code, I'm just gonna copy it. And this is some Python code that we're gonna run. And, um, then we're gonna run it by typing Python and then the name of the file where we where we copied that uh, Python code. If you have a, um, it's still running. If you have a, a Python debugger or something, you certainly could run it from the debugger itself. Um, so this is almost done, I hope. Okay, there it is. I just have to be patient. That's really what it is. Okay, so now that the OCI SDK is installed, then uh, I can uh, essentially create a, a, a document uh, called language.py with the code that I had. So I'll do it in Notepad right now, just to show you that, that it's very easy to do even with just like any text editor, Notepad language.py. Uh, yes, I wanna create a new file. And then um, I should be able to just save this right now. By the way, you can see here that it's um, that is reading the, the language from the configuration from the configuration file that we just created, right? And then it's doing operations such as detecting entities. I'm gonna save it and then I'm gonna open this from a proper uh, editor so that uh, it's a little bit easier to see. Um, but let's run it first and then I'll open it in the, from the editor. So I'm gonna just go Python language, language.py and this should, uh, this should run or execute that. If we did everything correctly in our credentials, then uh, right now it's kind of reading that configuration file and then it's for a, for a piece of text here, like uh, for this text that, it, oops, um, for this text right here, it's gonna run uh, entity detection, language detection, key phrase extraction, sentiment analysis, and text classification. So uh, just going back to the command line, you can see that it did all that already. And it prints the results for each, for each step, as you can see here, right? So, so there you go. It's just printing the JSON output, right? Uh, let me just actually open that from uh, from a from an editor that can do a little bit nicer printing of the of the comments and so forth. 
Um, so you can see here, essentially, once again, we're just setting up the thing by reading the configuration. And then uh, with just a couple of lines of code, we can issue actually, you know, like two lines of code. We we can issue the, the request to either you know the tech language, the tech entities, key phrases, depending on what you want. And then we're simply printing the output. So pretty straightforward uh, use of for SDK, right? Very, very easy to use. Now you can incorporate that into any of your Python programs um, so that uh, you know you can use these AI capabilities. You can power your applications through AI now. Okay, perfect. So uh, that was that was it for uh, for lab three. I mean, and now you know how to use or uh, or SDK, and you should be able to write a Python program that uses our um, language capabilities. Any questions so far? No, it, either we're super clear, or uh, or people are just watching and not worrying about uh, writing the code. We'll we'll find out. Um, I, Either way, don't be afraid of, of asking questions. Okay, so, okay, thank you, Jack. Jack says we're doing a good job. So let's keep moving. Okay, so now I like to see how things work in REST uh, in a, you know, like using REST APIs. Um, just because for me, that's like the, the common denominator, right? Like if you can do REST, then, then you, you can always grab it in any language if you need to or whatever, right? So for that, we're gonna use Postman. And uh, now the, the setup for Postman, honestly, is a little bit complicated. Once again, you just have to do it once, but um, actually you have to do it only once for, for all of OCI, but um, you still have to do it. So after you uh, have Postman installed, you have to download an OCI environment. Um, and so like if you do that and you just click on it, you, you will see the JSON for it. So what you have to do is, um, here, let me go back again. You want to right click on the link and click save link as, and you can see actually I had already saved that here yesterday as I went through the lab into a temporary, a temporary folder, right? And you're gonna do the same for, um, let me see, so that's the environment. And then there is a collection right here. There are two collections, OCI REST initialization and OCI REST collection. So you wanna do that for each of those. So actually I don't think I had saved the environment yesterday, but I'll save it right now. Save link as, and then I'll just save that environment. Okay, and then once you have that folder, here, let me see my desktop, I call it temp. So once you have that, uh, once you have those three uh, elements, then you're gonna go to your postman and you are going to click file import and um, Essentially, you can do like a drag and drop thing where you just kind of import your environment, for instance. And then and then click import right here. I already did it, so I'm not gonna click import. And then the same for your collections, right? So you're gonna, you can do this, drag them into the import interface and you can see that they will be imported as collections. And then you click import right here. Once your environment and your collections are imported, what you're gonna see is in the environment section, you're gonna see a new environment called OCI environment. It's gonna look like this, except it's not gonna have these elements filled. And you're gonna see two collections, one called OCI REST collection and OCI REST initialization. The first two on my list over here. Okay, so what we have to do is now is fill, go back to your environment and fill all the values here for your uh, for uh, your tenancy ID, auth user ID, key fingerprint. Essentially, all these elements are necessary for the system to know how to connect 
to OCI. And what are those? Well, the good news is remember in the previous lab, you had essentially generated that information and you had put it in your OCI folder. So remember the config file you had created? That has all that information right here. So let me, that has all that information, right? So you can essentially just copy, like let's say your user ID, your fingerprint, your tenancy, and put it in the right field for tenancy ID, user ID, fingerprint ID. And for the private key, you're gonna copy the content of the, of the PM file that you have, right? So essentially you're giving all that information to Postman so that it knows how to make these calls. So you copy it both into initial and current value. So I'll, just as an example, I'll just, um, let's say we have this. Actually, you know what? Let me open it in, in Notepad so it's a little bit, there you go. And then a little bit more explicit when I do the copy. So I, you wanna copy that, right? And then let's say for user ID, I will go to out user ID and I will paste that there, right? Once again, in my case, it didn't change because I had already done that. But so you do that four times essentially, right? Like you uh, for tenancy, user ID, fingerprint. And for the private key, you're gonna get the information from the private.pm file. You just copy from the very beginning where it says begin, begin private key all the way to where it says end private key. You copy the whole, the whole uh, uh, element uh, there into the private key field. All right. I hope that you're almost done with that. And um, when you're done, one thing that a lot of people forget, and that's why sometimes the lab doesn't work for them, is they forget to save. So you want to save that environment. Otherwise, uh, the values will not catch. OK, so once your environment is saved, you're going to go to your collection. And then remember, we have created, uh, exported, um, the, or rather imported, this OCI REST initialization um, call. So one time only, just to set things up, you're gonna have to call, uh, call this one-time initialization call. So you're just gonna go there, click on the get call, click send. And then once it's done, it's just gonna return, you know, like a bunch of code. Don't worry about it. Just have to do it once. And then once you have done that, you can go into the OCI REST collection. And if we did everything correctly, we can actually try some of the some of the calls. In this case, for instance, let's say that we want to detect language for this text, and you can see that it is indeed Spanish. Uh, you should be able to do the same and, and get results uh, in the correct. Uh, I mean, if if you did something wrong, this is not going to return any results. It's going to say like, "Hey, invalid authorization" or something along those lines. If uh, if the setup was done correctly, you should be getting proper JSON back. Any questions or uh, uh, is anyone stuck or, or anything like that? I wanna make sure that we help you guys. No? Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. So, so okay, I'm, Jack is a, a fan of Postman. Uh, thanks for, uh, for uh, staying engaged, Jack. Um, so, uh, once again, you can do that for detecting languages, detecting language entities, and so forth. Um, one new capability that we added, um, that we added uh, lately is, uh, let me see, I believe, I, is the ability to do things through batches. So, so, let me show you the differences. A little bit, the request is a little bit different. So uh, let me actually do um, this a little bit simpler. I am happy, or I'll say Luis is happy, just to, so we have a more explicit sentiment. 
And then I'm going to create another document. Um, this is not in the lab yet because it's a new capability. We're updating our lab to show batching capabilities, but I want you to be aware of it because it makes things more efficient. So um, I'm going to essentially enter two documents, document one and document two. One where it says Luis is happy, the other one says Luis is sad. And uh, what that means is that I can send in a single request, I can send several records at a time. I can, you know, I can send up to 100 records if I remember correctly, right? And that's more efficient than making 100 API calls. Um, so that's a new capability. And you can see the each of the requests has to have a unique ID in this case, like I created a doc one or doc two, they don't have to say doc, they could be alpha or whatever, Ooh, as long as they're unique for each record, it'll be okay. And then um, for each of the elements, you, you get a response. For instance, let's say for foo, you will also see the key here. And then the, the you know, like kind of the response or, the, or what you expect uh, back from the API right here, right? So in this case, Luis is sad, so it's negative sentiment and so forth. Um, but this is this is a new capability that we introduce just so that we can make uh, processing faster. And this would be uh, very important as you deal with thousands or, or maybe tens of thousands of records uh, that you want to process, right? Okay. Uh, let me see. Um, all right, let's move on. I hope that at a minimum, you understand that you can issue REST APIs uh, for each of our uh, capabilities and uh, that you can also issue batching requests. Uh, you will have to change the URLs to, you know, do batch detect sentiment, language sentiment and so forth, but that's uh, well documented in our, in our documentation on how to use batch. Okay, so now we go to the last, um, element and I think we're running how are we doing with time let me just check because I am uh sorry do we finish at 9 30 Tara or at uh, or at 10 I'm trying to remember 10 yeah oh 10 okay so we have time okay perfect so we may not have time to go super deep on the last section but I want you to be aware that uh you can call or APIs from a data science notebook session. Uh, for instance, uh, think of uh, if you're a data scientist, you may be doing some analysis. And uh, for instance, you may want to understand, hey, what is the correlation between, uh, I don't know, let's say the, the, the amount of investment that a customer does and the sentiment uh, in their support tickets? Or, or what is the correlation between the, the key topics that they issue them the amount of investment that they did. Or can I predict something like that, right? So in many, case, in many cases, you have to deal with unstructured text. And ideally, you don't have to go and think of like, hey, how do we create a natural language processing model every time that you have to do something like that, right? So we want to make it easy for you to, to consume uh, OCI language from data science uh, notebooks as well. So let's go to... Um, in this case, we're going to navigate to analytics and AI. And uh, we're going to go to data science. And once again, it takes some time to create a, 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 a notebook uh, or rather a, a data science environment because you need, to, um, you need to start a virtual machine. So don't worry about trying to follow what I do in real time. It's better if you just understand the concept and then you can do it by yourself. So you're going to create a project. And uh, in this case, I already created one. But all you have to do for that is, is enter like the compartment where you want to do it and, and the, the, the description if you want to. And once you have created a project, you can create a notebook session. And this is what takes time. You, essentially, you are instantiating a new, a new machine, essentially, right? And you can select the type of machine. I tend to like VM standard 2.8, uh, one machine with at least eight cores when I, when I use a data science notebook. 
And for the storage size, usually about 50 gigabytes. Uh, you don't need a lot of, of memory um, or I guess storage for the type of work that we're going to do, but uh, you know, 50 gigabytes is a good uh, starting point. Once you enter that, let me say like 50 here, you can see that now you could create such a notebook session. I am not gonna do it, that takes about five minutes. Uh, I already did it uh, so that I can explain to you the concept. And uh, so I created this language lab notebook session just yesterday. So once it's active, once it's instantiated, if you are just creating it right now, it's gonna take about five minutes again, um, but make sure to refresh and then it will show active and this will be green. That means you're ready to consume it, then you can open it. <coughs> and uh, it may ask you to sign in. Okay, and once again, the hardest thing here is gonna be configuration and setup. Uh, uh, so there are, there are a few, um, what you want to do, sorry, if uh, you, the first time that you see this, you may see actually a launcher like this, and uh, or you can create a, like essentially a new notebook or, um, or you can open a terminal. So in my case, um, open the terminal or you just click terminal here and it will open something like this again. And guess what? Essentially the same setup that we did for our own computer, we will have to do here. So we're going to have to make a directory called OCI. I already created it myself. So, and I, you can see that I already put there both the config file and the private PEM file. Same, same concept, right? Essentially create an OCI folder and put the config and the private PEM files. Now the catch is how do you copy the private PEM and the config files to that directory? So it's a little bit of a hack that we're gonna do, but it's not too hard. So I'm gonna go to my, you may remember my, my let's just do it right now. So I'm gonna go to my OCI file, uh, sorry, folder in my, in my computer and uh, check this out. I can do literally this. I can just drag and drop into this section right here. And I'll do that for both the config file and the private PM file. Okay. So that puts it in this, in the kind of like the, the root folder, I guess, right? Uh, for, or for, the, um, for the notebook, right? So, you can see that among other files, I have there the config file that I just copied and the private PEM file, right? So the first thing that you want to do, and it's gonna fail for me because I already did it, but it's all documented. I just wanna show you in the, in the lab, right? So let me show you. Yeah, like essentially you have to make the OCI directory. For me, it probably will fail because it doesn't make sense to make a directory that already exists. But I'll just show you. Um, so it says, that, but for you, it should work, right? Like, because in my case, I already, I already had created the directory. So I'm just gonna, and now what I want to do is move those files that I put here just in this subfolder called OCI that I just have created. And I'll do that right now. Uh, once again, that's documented in the workshop. So MB is for move and then the path of the config file to, to the OCI directory. So I'll just do it for one, but you can do it for both of them. Um, so I'll do move. And then in my case, let's say private.pm. And then uh, the path to the OCI directory. Okay, so you can see, and you will do the same, not just for the private PM, but you will do the same for the config file. Okay, so it will be something like move config.
like that. In my case, I'm not going to do it, and I'll explain to you why, because I already had modified my config uh, afterwards, but you will do exactly that. Then we move to the, then let's take a look at the configuration. So the problem is, so I'm going to move, um, if, if you change the directory to go to OCI, to the OCI folder, you should see two files, config and private PEN, okay? If you do cat uh, on uh, config, chances are that your, uh, like, that your uh, key file is not pointing to this directory, right? We wanted to point uh, to this directory uh, because probably it's pointing to some location in your local hard drive or whatever, right? So, so we need to change that. Um, I mean, you can use whatever uh, your, your favorite editor is for, uh, for uh, uh, Linux or Unix, but I can use BI improved, let's say, and uh, I'll just go to um, the config file. I just wanna edit the config file. If I click I for insert, I can modify this, right? And you want to make sure that it, you modify it so that it looks like this. Uh, the tilde forward slash dot OCI forward slash private PM. Then I'm gonna click escape to exit insert mode and colon W for write uh, and then colon Q to quit VIN. Okay, so now, uh, okay, so this was a little complicated, but now we have all the credentials that we need to use, not only OCI language, but really any OCI capabilities from within our notebook. Then the workshop tells you to, to download, actually let's go here, to download two, two files here, and uh, I'm gonna click on them. So you can see here, like this will copy to your uh, local uh, uh, drive, this IPython notebook here, let me see. I have done this six times as you can see, but in your case, hopefully we'll just say sentiment.ipnb, like IPython notebooks. And uh, so what you want to do is do that for both sentiment analysis, named entity recognition, and uh, for the data set that is in task two. Once you have done that, and uh, what, I, what I did is, is uh, I actually saved each of these to, uh, to a folder in my, in my desktop. Let's see. Like data, CSV, and sentiment and any other Python notebook, right? And then you can essentially do the same thing where you can just drag and drop them from one place to another. Uh, here from, from my local drive, I can literally, I'm just gonna copy the data. I won't do it for the notebooks because I already ran them so that I can show you the out, output. But essentially you, you will repeat this step for each, of the, for each of the files. So you just drag them in here then that will write it to, to your kind of root folder for the notebook. And I, let's say I wanna, in my case, uh, because it's already there, it's asking me if I wanna overwrite it, let's say yes, sure. In that case, it doesn't hurt me anything at all. And then, then you can, once you have copied the IPython notebook and the sentiment IPython notebook, then you can click on them. And this has uh, essentially a step by step, and I already ran it, but, um, on how to use uh, the APIs. And, you know, I will show you some, some nice examples of highlighting of, let's say in this case, entities that were extracted using the OCI language uh, capabilities. So let's just walk through this um, step by step. Uh, and then, um, then we'll uh, go back and, and kind of check for questions uh, before we close the lab. So first of all, you're going to install some uh, um, core libraries to run a particular cell within the, the notebook. Uh, you, you use the shift enter. And um, 
So you can see that in my case, I already did one. So it's just saying like, hey, I already did this. Why are you doing this again? For in your case, for the first time, it will take a little bit of time. Uh, and once this has run properly, then you will see that it went from a little star here to, to a number. The number represents like, uh, like how essentially this is step 23 that I have done where I have run this uh, at least 23 cells in the past. So you just go like in order and then, but I'll, let's do it right now, but I am going to be explaining to you what is, what is happening, right? So this, in this case, we're gonna import a set of libraries. You will, if you're following with me or if you're trying to do this yourself, you will notice that I added an extra import here and I will explain to you why in a second. But uh, if you're doing this with me, just click, just add the import timeline to this import. Everything else should be the same as it was in when you downloaded the, the folder. Then you do shift enter. You see very quickly turn into a number, so it's done. I'll, I'll keep doing that, shift enter. This uh, line is reading the data.csv file. Essentially, it's just some data. It's actually, I don't, I don't remember, like a few hundreds or thousands of, of reviews that, uh, that we extracted so that we can show you some, uh, some real data and analyze it. Um, okay, so we're just converting it to, I don't know why we need to do this conversion to an e.csv, but it doesn't matter, let's just run it for now. And then, um, okay, so we're just massaging the data a little bit so that you can, and then we display the, the head of the data or the, the first few rows. And you can see, for instance, here we have an ID, we have um, uh, some reviews, right? Which is the important part here. Like it looks like they come from TripAdvisor. And, um, and then you, the code here below should look very familiar to you because it's exactly the same code as we were running when we were using Python by ourselves, right? We're just reading the credentials from the config file that you just created and we're instantiated an AI service language client so that we can issue all these calls such as detecting languages, detecting key phrases, sentiment, and so forth. And then there is this for loop where um, essentially for each of the reviews, we're issuing a call to the service. So like, because there are thousands of these reviews, essentially it's calling the service a thousand times, let's say, right? Now I made a small change here. And remember I told you to import time at the very top because I wanted to make a small change to the code where I added a sleep here, like it's just sleep 200 milliseconds between each call. And the reason is this code is too simple. It's a little too simple. And what happens is the, the if you create a tight loop where you're calling the service, Eventually the service is like, wait, 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 I'm still analyzing what you sent me, uh, you know, a couple of seconds ago. Like, um, so, so the, the, the ideal code will say like, okay, I, I'll call you as quickly as I can. But then if you, if you tell me to stop, I will kind of backtrack and I'll, I'll start to do like exponential backtracking. But that's a little bit too complex to understand the concept uh, in a lab. So instead I just put a, a small slip 200 milliseconds, and that just gives the system breathing room to be able to, to answer any questions that you're sending to it. And uh, if you click shift enter, it's just gonna take a while because it's literally just uh, taking each of those reviews, uh, analyzing it, waiting for 200 milliseconds. So, so it's gonna take a couple of minutes. So I already ran this yesterday to say to save the time as I do this session today, but if you run it, you just let it run for a couple of minutes and then it will be done. I already cached the results so I can show you the rest of it. Um, but after that, essentially you already have the, this result uh, data frame where we have all the, the results of all the entities that were identified and so forth. And then there is some fancy code here to this pretty printing of the entities from, from some of the reviews. So as you can see, right, like it can show you like uh, different types of entities and what they are. Uh, so if you run it, you'll be able to, to see that. Obviously, 
this is just an example, right? Uh, in your case, you may want to be doing something else. Maybe, as I said, uh, identifying like, hey, given the geopolitical entities that are mentioned, I don't know, like, uh, is there a correlation to a different field or something? This is where somebody would want to do some kind of data science. Um, okay, so the rest is just kind of doing other visualizations over the information, like, hey, like how many entities are shown as products, ordinal, geopolitical entities, dates, organizations, persons, and so forth. Similarly, we have this sentiment type Python notebook. You will follow the same, the same pattern. So it's less important for me to, to explain uh, line by line in this case, but uh, you, you will see exactly the same, the same pattern, except in this case, we're interested in in sentiment, uh, in this case, aspect level sentiment. So I can see very quickly like uh, um, both positive and negative sentiment highlighted in, in, in the reviews that we just analyzed. And you know you can do analysis. Uh, for instance, you, could, you may want to say like, given the, the thousands of reviews that I have, hey, like what, how do people feel about my runes? And in this case, you can see that there is, a lot of people feel good about it, but a lot of people also have a bad experience, right? Uh, on the other, on, on another case, like the location, everyone loves the location, right? So you can do analysis like this uh, based on your data. Okay, uh, once again, you just click shift enter for each row and then you can do all these fancy things such as the word clouds that, that we have towards the end of the sentiment uh, notebook. I'll let you do, we'll let that be your homework essentially. Um, Okay, so I think with that, I hope that this gives you an idea of what you can do with, uh, with the workshop and uh, how to use OCI language uh, from, from, the, from the console, from the cloud shell, uh, from REST APIs, using the different SDKs, including uh, in a data science notebook. Just because some of you may be applying this in the next couple of weeks. And uh, let me see. And we want to make sure uh, to understand, hey, what are you using language for? Or maybe you have uh, an opportunity to use this, let's say with your, with your own uh, company or with a customer. And uh, we're interested in great stories, right? Uh, if, you get, if you have an interesting use case for OCI languages, contact me. Maybe we can uh, co-market uh, some of the work that you're doing. We want to show success stories using our AI services. So here is my email. Feel free to, to contact me. Also, if there is some feedback that you have either on the lab or the service, uh, we will be happy to address it. So we have some additional resources here. The first thing, if you enjoyed today's session, we'd like to invite you to join us at our next developer lab, which will be on February 24th. And this is going to be about Oracle MySQL database service um, and how it allows de developers to quickly develop and deploy secure cloud native apps using the world's most popular open source database. And then we also encourage you to share with us any feedback that you have on today's session or what you'd like to see from us going forward. And then if you have any questions specifically about the lab, we also have an email for you to contact us there as well. So I just dropped that in the chat and also in the Slack. And then um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we'd like to test your knowledge on what you learned today. So by completing several questions of our lab quiz correctly, you'll achieve a social badge, which you can share on your social media. And then lastly, uh, Oracle University is now offering free access to OCI training, including free certification exams through the end of this month. So there's still some time left to check that out and uh, get started. So that concludes all of our slides. I wanted to thank Luis and Camille again for the presentation and support, and thank you all for spending your time here with us. And so with that, I will go ahead and end today's session. Have a great day, and we hope to see you again next time. Thank you all. Bye-bye.